thank you so much. Obviously, uh, knowing who's in attendance, uh, I know that every one of you could be up here speaking as well, so I'm, I'm unbelievably flattered. Uh, you know, it's interesting, as you were saying, disagreeing with or, or adding to the conversation. Something's become very obvious to me only in the last couple of weeks um, that maybe I'll, I'll pontificate a little bit here, which is I think the biggest reason so many people within the marketing landscape do have uh, disagreements with some of my points of view is because I really don't think of myself as a marketer, for se. I no question think of myself far more as a business operator who happens to have a knack or an intuition towards marketing which has helped me throughout my career, but everything I believe in is predicated on the final result of what everybody in this room is trying to achieve. I just think that marketing and communications is an incredible way to get there. You can put it right there, thanks d Rock. Um, and so what is, for a lot of you that don't know my career, I was born in the former Soviet Union, I came to the US and my father grew from being a stock boy to owning a small liquor store in New Jersey and when I joined that business, I fell, first I fell in love with wine and wine collecting which was great because it's always good if you like what you're doing. But I built my dad's business from a three to a $60 million business very quickly in the late 90s without any VC capital, even without a credit line. When I think about how remarkable that growth was, it was completely predicated on practicality which is really my North Star today. No, you know, if I had the luxury to sit and have dinner or breakfast with you one on one for four hours and we actually talked about what you're trying to achieve in your business, so much of what I believe in, whether it's Facebook or Instagram or content or te- you know, text messaging is starting to really be fascinating to me because in the US and many other markets for about a decade we haven't allowed marketing inside of our text numbers and all of a sudden I'm seeing people <coughs> willing to do that which you can imagine is attractive for us marketers and business people. So I think the biggest reason I'm you know, interesting in debating in the marketing landscape is I'm not a product or a son of Nielsen ratings or data logics or brand lift studies or impressions or drop, you know. If you knew nothing about marketing and you were a normal business person you wouldn't be attracted to low CPMs. You would be attracted to high CPMs because it would lead to what you're trying to achieve. So I sit in marketing meetings in, for major clients around the world. I sit at conferences, events like this, and people pontificate on data in the middle that has nothing to do with the end business result. That is my problem. That is why I'm an outlier. That's why I'm different. I'm, I'm not of the machine, I'm of the business result. I'm not, you know, it's really interesting. By only running businesses for myself my whole life, I only care about long-term branding and marketing. A lot of times people think about digital as a short-term sales funnel. I think of it as reverse. I think Facebook and Instagram, and thank you so much for being a part of this, but I think that they're doing not a good job in expressing how much branding is done in their channels because the conversion is so obvious for math and sales. When I think about this room, whatever it may be the business result that one's trying to achieve, I watch so many of your behaviors globally in overspending for A-list celebrities in Hollywood that don't have the value they used to, in overspending in quant-based transactional Google and Facebook behavior where CAC and LTV are the religion and branding is not. I watch a lot of things that if I bought your business or if I ran it, I wouldn't believe in, but everything in the system everything that the marketing industry has been built on for the last half century values things that I just don't think are mapping to reality. I'm I'm, I'm fresh eyes to this industry. I've only been in an environment where big companies have been part of my life for the last decade. Prior to that it was only entrepreneurship in Silicon Valley and so it's it's been an amazing journey for me the last half decade in watching what what is put on a pedestal in an environment when you don't see every dollar spent where it goes to, what happens when you fall too deep into just caring about the value of every dollar in the short term. It's, you know, to, to be honest, to, for my DNA, it's a bizarro world. You know, an industry that goes to the south of France to celebrate itself on subjective creative and uses those awards to justify hundreds of millions of dollars in spend is fascinating. <laughs> it is. 
You know, and I think the giggles, and the giggles come from a deep understanding of the truth. You know, and so here we are in 2019, whether in the UAE, America, Europe, all over the world, you have, you have a game of two individuals. You have people who are spending money and it's not their business, and you have people that are spending money and that's how they feed their family. And those two people, the way they spend their money and what they believe in have never been more opposite than today. And that's what I'm fascinated by. The people that are incentivized of the health of the business in the short and long term versus the people that are incentivized on the KPIs within the machine that they have to navigate through. I deploy empathy. I used to judge a lot of people in this room on paper a decade ago. I thought I was smarter. I know I'm not smarter. I just know that I'm playing a different game. I'm running a marathon in perpetuity. I put out content to be historically correct so I can trade on reputation in a decade, not on what pays my bills in the short term. So I have the advantage of the framework that I've stumbled into within this environment, but it doesn't make it any less true. And so a couple things that I would, t- you know, if you leave with anything, the, the one word I would leave with if you're in here today is volume. The, the sheer volume of content that is needed by the businesses in this room is staggering. It's staggering. If you get your above the line creative agency to interpret your TV and make a ton more content for the internet, if you have a digital shop that does a lot of content, if you do publishing deals where Condé or Hearst or Refinery or PureWow are giving you content, if you build internal capabilities for content, if you have all four of those things humming, you're still 90% short on how much content you need in a 2019 world if you understand how the Googles and Facebooks and Snapchats actually work. If you, if you are a deep practitioner of the media capabilities of 2019 across the biggest platforms, which, oh, by the way, in this region have so much attention it's uncomfortable, if you really understand that, you'll realize, my God, I need 20,000, 8,000 unique pieces of content for different psychographic, demographic individuals. And as you all know, Even Vayner, which I'm trying to move in the direction of being the disproportionate leader in quality and quantity, there's no engine in the world right now that's even remotely close to the needs that we actually have. So that to me is the big one. That to me is in the last six months the thing that is absolutely synthesized, which is my God, if you really did it perfect, you know, and and you really spent it every penny the way I did for my father's business perfect, you need 20,000 pieces of meaningful content for a year. That's about 19,900 more than most people have. And so that, I think, will be the debate over the next half decade. How do you have quality content at scale to take advantage of the grossly underpriced media capabilities of the YouTubes, the Snapchats, the Facebooks, and the Instagrams over the next half decade? Then consumer behavior will change either to our hosts hope the prices become appropriate like they did on Google search or people's attention will move on like it was on MySpace. That I don't know, I don't guess. I only trade on the day we live in. What I know is if you look at the sheer data of what's happening in this region specifically, and this is global outside of mainland China and Russia, if you look at the sheer actual consumption not a GRP or an impression, which is a potential reach, but actual reach. If you just look at YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Snapchat, this is the golden era to market in this region and most people are not taking advantage of it because either A, they've allocated dollars to traditional places based on reports of yesterday, or B, even if they are, it's not successful because they don't have enough content to fill the pipes of the media distribution. That to me is what's going on. Well, what do you see in the U.S. at the moment and reflecting again upon the fact that most of the people in the room are from big companies, Yes. Right? So what are you seeing, and you mentioned that point around volume. Of yes. Content. What else are you seeing or understanding from the shift how big businesses are approaching marketing? Because it tends to be in the Middle East, we're a bit behind, let's be honest. And it's good for us to get an understanding of what will impact us here. Well, it's interesting, right? Because if you look in the Middle East and, you know, the the on the outrageous levels of consumption on YouTube, Snapchat, Facebook, and Instagram should speak to this market being ahead in a lot of ways or the e-commerce capabilities of the next decade. I know that's a little less for maybe this group, but obviously 
as you evolve. So I think in the U.S. and I, I, I assume it's the case here, as people start allocating more money to digital, my concern is they're allocating it to bad digital. So a lot of times people will come up to me and be like, Gary, great news, I saw you in 2012 and we've moved to 60% digital and then when I, back to why I wanna have breakfast for four hours, when I unpack it, of that 60%, 80% is because they built an internal DSP and they're spending 80% of their money of that 60% on programmatic pre-roll banner ads and, and, webs- and banners on webs- I mean websites. And, 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 and the only KPI is the cost of the CPM. They're incentivizing their media agencies to drive down the cost of the CPM and they're bonusing them on hitting. Guys, $3 CPMs outside of Instagram and Snapchat right now is garbage. It means you're getting nothing. It means nobody's seeing it. And so what I'm seeing in the US is a shift to digital, unfortunately to digital that I think is even worse than TVC. And that's why you're seeing so much disruption. You know, a lot of people are allocating their money and their creative to places where eyeballs aren't, but they're supposed to be based on reports that are incentivized to have you spend your money there. What have been from a consumer? Things that matter to an end consumer if you look at behavior throughout the world. Utility or escapism? Something that entertains somebody or something that brings value? If you look at all your phones right now and look at the apps on your front screen, I promise you they fall into either one of those two categories. A utility or something that entertains you. And so, you know, one thing we're seeing is that people are running away from ads. I think we all understand that. I I think the question becomes how are best practices being evolved? So for example, one thing that we're fascinated by, here's a little secret, um, not in Facebook's best practices, it's funny, the media side of Facebook loves me because I just believe it's so underpriced uh, on both Facebook and Instagram, but the creative shop who <laughs> is not as happy with me because I think best practices are wrong because I think the best practices are pandering to reports to show brand lift studies. I don't think you should show your logo in the first three seconds. I have unlimited data on sales and actual business results that shows you that's a bad idea. I also think length. We are producing so many two to four minute videos for Facebook and YouTube while everybody talks about shorter and shorter. You can make a very bad six second video. You can make a remarkable three minute video. I think on the creative side, the thing we're seeing that's fascinating is people will watch four minute videos if you make something remarkable. And so, you know, it's very, it's kind of, the, the level of common sense that I bring to the conversation is very important to me. It, you know, again, I always say, make pretend we weren't in this industry. If you make a four minute video that is actually good and interesting, it's far more likely they'll see that than a 15 second commercial that just talks about the price of something or you know, an ad. You mentioned about how much of the content is actually made for utility or how much of it is actually made for ourselves, right? How much is made for them or for yourselves? Yeah. I think utility and entertainment can be made for them. I think that if you look at a lot of the communications in this room, I'm sure if you were to self-audit, you'd be surprised how much is self-serving. Exactly, and that's the point I want to come to, right? There's a level of awareness that companies need to have in terms of what they're doing inside their organizations for their own ego, and how do you instill something, a culture in an organization that they're actually aware of what they're doing for themselves versus for their... That's very hard. You, you do that by whoever runs the company sets that tone. Every company's DNA is predicated on the CEO. Whoever she or he is, they're gonna dictate that. So if she or he are disproportionately egotistical around subjective creative, the whole organization will go up that. I think that you know, that's, that's something outside the pay grade of like marketing that is just absolutely operational throughout the entire world. You know, what is being held up as a religion internally is fascinating. I, looking at the, you know, knowing who's in this room, you're either mathed out or you're art out. You know, there, there are very few organizations that have a 50-50 balance. You either have a DNA internally that disproportionately wants celebrities from Hollywood and wants a one minute video that feels good or you're disproportionately Google and emailed out for CAC and LTB and I'm fascinated why most organizations haven't found that 50-50 balance in understanding how both matter and then more importantly, how do we actually score within that, right? Creative scorecard is laughable. It's human subjectiveness or reports that are so laughably outdated or finally awards or finally three or four magazines 
that say it's a good piece of creative. Like the way we judge is, meanwhile, we live in a world where you can put this creative in a Facebook or YouTube environment and you can get qualitative feedback at scale and just listen to the customer instead. The problem is most people start top down, not bottom up. So you overspend so heavily on one video that you're at the mercy of reporting or Ipsos or ACE testing or all these things that are just, again, if you don't know anything about them like I didn't eight years ago when you actually study him. You know, first time I ever heard award-winning work leads to business results, which was like a big debate I heard in the advertising world. I just had some two people on my team in, in research and strategy find out where that started. It was funded by agencies. Sounds right. And so I, I think those are the themes of today, no question. And in themes in terms of risks, right? We're seeing this huge disruption across lots of different industries, Uber, Airbnb, et cetera. How can companies try to identify the shifts that are going to come, these tectonic shifts that are taking place, and what should they do about it? Well, I think everybody here should take a very simple stance like I did a long time ago, which is that the internet will eliminate the middle. Right? If you, if you actually understand what the internet does in its most basic form, it eliminates anybody in the middle that provides no value. That's the squeeze. So for me, I think everybody in this room needs to think about a couple things. If the internet squeezes the middle, that's how it plays out. Airbnb made so much sense to me, if you think about it. It's just inventory that exists that the internet connected two parties to. No different than Uber, no different than everything else. And so. Listen, if you're an airline, you know, obviously somebody has to then own a plane and that becomes a, a cog that's more expensive than other things. But you know, rooms have less costs involved as we've seen play out and then you start getting into experiences and other variables but you can't just rely on the utility part of that. You've got to layer it. Um, it's kind of how I think about what's happened with television. It's the reason I knew that commercials were going to be in trouble. It's not that, it's not that I'm predicting it's every day that you see Netflix and YouTube consumption numbers go up, that's a problem for a network television. And then you just live in common sense. Like consuming a commercial during a television program is a very wild rarity in 2019 when we all have mobile devices. I always laugh when people in the US say, but sports commercials are good. Meanwhile, the data is very black and white. The biggest spike on social media is during the commercials of major sporting events because everybody wants to talk about what LeBron or Messi or Tom Brady did, right? And so, uh, you know, it just feels like one big game of inside baseball where there's a lot of financial incentives to hold up a facade that no longer exists. And unfortunately for the biggest brands in the world, the executives making the financial decisions are not incentivized to do the right thing. They're incentivized to follow the scoring that's been created internally. That's on the CEO's head. So based on that, what are the conversations that these guys should have when they go back to the office and they're interacting, whether it's with the CEO, what is the type of conversation that needs to come to the fore? I think you look in the mirror and ask yourself, do you think the money you're spending is actually driving what you want to happen. Like flat out. And then once you answer that for yourself, if it's yes, then you move on with your way. But if it's no, then it's either the internal MMM, the CEO, the CMO, the board. Like who are these humans that are forcing a framework that makes you spend money in a way that you as a human who've been empowered to spend it doesn't believe in? That has been the most interesting thing for me. That is, as you can imagine, knowing my narrative, when you come from family business environments or a startup, now it's different because the amount of sheer venture capital money in the system has changed it. I would say startups now act way more like corporations. They're not doing what's right for the business, they're doing what's right for the next round of funding. So it's become, that's why I stopped investing four years ago, it became no different than this. But, you know, look, I, I used to think I was smart sitting up here with you. Now I realize that more than half the people in here 100% will agree with everything I say, but internally, if they were to spend all their money on influencers or pre-roll YouTube or Facebook videos, it wouldn't score. It wouldn't score. It wouldn't be accepted. And that I have to have empathy for. That's no different than looking at Claude and Eric and realizing 
there's certain things they do within VaynerMedia that they know I will score or the machine will score a certain way, thus making their behavior go in a way that may not be exactly 100% what they believe in. That's the reality. It's just the sheer amount of waste in a 2019 world where the attention actually is, is so staggering, which is why we've seen such a decline from the biggest brands in the world in market share. It's very large. The declines are very real. You know, just in, it's just, it's happening. And so people will rest on the cogs or the infrastructure that they have, and then slowly but surely, there'll be innovation, and you wake up one day, and that, and what you assumed was your leadership role is eliminated because there's so much money in the system right now that allows people to innovate in a way that we haven't seen before. So, so based on what I apologize said, real quick, yeah. but let me give an example. I was just thinking about airlines, right? Like, like rockets are coming. Like, like, you know, like I'm super pumped to go to Hong Kong in three hours. Like, you know, like it's not something that won't happen. And, uh, you know, and so I think that when the private sector gets into air travel, like it has in the US and other parts of the world, it just becomes a matter of time. And so it just, you've just seen this in the history of, like the railroads had a big advantage. Those tycoons made a lot of money. Like everybody's day will come. And I think the most practical thing to do, and this is why I started this company, for myself, for my future businesses, in a day when innovation will come and create a vulnerability, the number one thing that is feasible, instead of running home and saying, let's start a rocket division, is not spending a million dollars on print ads in 2019 when nobody goes to page 213 of a magazine. So talk us through some of the, because that's, that's a great, nice, pithy piece of advice. Talk, given the shifts that you're talking about, explain some of the other steps that you would take if you were a marketeer, given the environment you just painted. If, you know, it's funny, a lot of people razz on me for my absolute statements, but I think of marketing like poker. If you have the best hand, you go in. I'm a boy, and I say a boy because this is what I was a kid when this happened. I am unbelievably, uh, I regret tremendously not spending all my money on Google in 2001 to 2004. When I rewound how I built my dad's business, it was because I was handed a full house. It was called Google, day one, five cents a click. My CAC was 10 cents, my LTV was $8. I didn't understand, because I didn't know. I didn't have experience yet. I didn't know how to quantify it. It seemed normal to me. I was digitally native. This seemed like it made sense. Why wouldn't everybody do this? And then it went away. And then 2007, 8, 9 happened. So for me, we're sitting in that moment right now. Instagram story ads are so grossly underpriced, it's almost uncomfortable. I've, I've, I'm running, actually this is amazing. Maha, are you in here? Where are you? Yeah, you know this. In four minutes, in four minutes, in five days, my follow count on my Gary Vee Arabic page went from 900 people to 30,000. 700 people. 700 people to 30,000 because we found a single piece of content that I converted into Arabic from a piece of content that is achieving 1.9 cent follows on Instagram. If you understand how like the friction to get somebody to follow you based on an impression, Think about how inexpensive I'm getting in front of every, every Arabic speaking person that is on Instagram to get 1.9 cent follows. So when I found out on a $200 spend that that was working, I just poured all my money into it. And, I, and by the way, I'm gonna pour all my money into it in perpetuity because I wanna extract the underpriced nature of the media. And I figured out how to create the volume of content that broke through to eventually get me a 1.9 cent follow because we've gotten on our 30th piece of content, we got there not on our first. People are running, making one video and then putting it on YouTube and Facebook and then saying, is it work or not? We're not producing creatively, natively, contextually to the platforms that we're advertising on. We're using television mentality for the internet. It's just, it's, it's remarkably wrong and, and not even Vayner and let alone all the traditional agencies are not in a position to create the work needed for the realities of the marketplace. Talk, talk us through a couple of things there. You mentioned Instagram and obviously the shift towards video. Talk us through creating great content for that and also in an increasingly mobile world, can you build a brand on mo- mobile alone? Of course you can because you can build a brand on attention and the sheer amount of attention on mobile is extraordinary. As a matter of fact, why would, you know, to me, like when I look at outdoor, 
and I like outdoor. There was a nice little digital outdoor of me speaking today. I get excited about that. I like outdoor, but I don't like outdoor pricing in a world where while I saw my little outdoor piece, I looked around the cars on the way here and every single person not driving was looking at their phone. I, I'm, I'm, even the drivers, to your point. I'm a very simple guy. Tell me where the attention is. Tell me what the cost is associated with it. Do I think that's right? Can I then create creative to fill it? at a low enough cost that I can test seven, 10, 15. This is not A, B testing. This is A to quadruple Z testing. So for me, it's about producing quality content at a low enough cost. Quality being contextual and empathetic, not high production. Let me say that very slow because it's super important. Quality being contextual to the distribution and being empathetic. You have to know how to overlay a sticker or an animated GIF on an Instagram story to get people's attention because that's native to that platform. Not doing matching luggage of your TVC for a short form 15 second video for YouTube. That's what big companies do. Yeah, talk us through how companies are getting it wrong. You mentioned there what you can do. They start with television. You've already lost. So you make a TVC or a brand campaign and then you ask somebody, whether it's that agency or somebody else or internally, to cut it down for Facebook and Instagram and YouTube. You're already in trouble for a couple reasons. By nature, brand campaigns and television are vanilla because you're trying to reach everybody with the reach of that campaign. If you start from the bottom, you can go after expats from the UK versus expats from the US. As you can imagine, if you know that that's who you're gonna reach, your message is gonna be slightly different. I'm filming right now everywhere I go, me and DRock. Like I'm standing outside with these beautiful views. We were here a little early and I'm saying, hey Snapchat, find out why I'm here at the UAE. I'm literally filming for the distribution. Just by saying what's up Facebook as my opening line disproportionately increases the shareability and earned media because I made the creative native to the distribution. I didn't make one video that's gonna be super glossy and then try to use everything. Everybody views these channels as distribution. I view them as contextual creative platforms. I'm not trying to get reach that isn't achieved because I didn't make content for it. Everybody's playing in a GRP and reach world without having a common sense layer over it of are you actually getting that reach and then number two, does your content speak to that reach? We didn't have that with television. <coughs> but now I can, I can attack the seven million people in this market in 31 cohorts that matter. Men and women are different. 18 year olds are different than 49 year olds. Making a million dollars a year is different than making $40,000 a year. We do not take that into account in creative because creative costs are too high. Machines for creative aren't built for scale. That is the rub in our industry. The media people know this. When I announced our framework that leads off of what I'm talking about in September, where I started my company meeting with, I'm gonna put us out of business before somebody else does, it was the media people that most liked this creative strategy. The creative people like to hold on to the political power of making a subjective call, not letting the market's reactions, quantum and qual, dictate creative adjustment. So it's a very, very interesting time right now. We have way too many conversations in the ad world about the media side of things. We are not having the proper conversation of the subconscious bias against the wrong creative process for this world. I'm like you, so which companies or brands do you feel are, are big companies are, are getting it right? Which ones kind of inspire you in that sense? I'm super sad this question was asked because, and I'll tell you why, I spend zero time knowing. I don't know. I, I spent, when I tell you I spend zero time, I have no idea who's doing it well. I'll never go by the media rags because it's not their fault. They're, they don't know the details. I mean, we did incredible, <coughs> incredible work at GE but the business wasn't run well, so the business isn't healthy. To me, good marketing is only affecting the business. So just because Burberry or Taco Bell in the last decade have done some cool things, it has, I have no feel if it's actually dictating the business. For me, marketing is a driver to the business. So I know what's happening at Kraft or Pinnacle Foods or Johnson & Johnson that we're doing well, but that's not a fun answer to say my clients, right? because a lot of my clients aren't doing it well because they're half pregnant on this thesis or haven't bought in. And so 
I don't know. I really don't. What's holding them back if, if your clients haven't bought in? They've bought into you. Yeah. Why but, haven't they bought into the whole concept then? Because they have a machine internally, whether it's their MMM or it's their bosses or it's their own political insecurities that are driving their behavior. Why do you engage with them? Well, because you've got to, you know, for me, selfishly, I started the media company, and I'm, this is pretty known to every client that I work with, because I eventually want to buy brands when the economy collapses. So I engage with them because I'm trying to look under the hood to understand if my pontifications are true, right? So, and I'm collecting people. You know, there's a lot of, again, there's a lot of smart people in the industry who just have on the wrong jersey. It's like a good athlete. Sometimes they get traded and then they excel. So, how, how do you identify that talent? Through meetings, through meetings. You know, you get to know people. At, you know, almost always, very few people are super bought into the extreme version. There's nuances they like, and then and then you start seeing how people react to truth. If executives lean in on the first example of, oh my God, that media spend and creative spend actually drove our business. If they lean in, I'm intrigued by that. A lot of people push back because now it's a vulnerability. So I'm trying to figure out if somebody just wants to have a corporate career and maximize that for the next six years or are people thinking about 10, 20 years? So I'm, I'm reacting to just meetings, nothing super complicated. Guys, we've been talking for a while. It's interesting, does anyone disagree with anything that's being said from a Middle Eastern perspective? You're such a lovely bunch of people. I don't <laughs> disagree with anything. Yes, Please. thank you very much. Your point about marketing teams being either too bought into being audited out yes. or dated out yes. is, is fair. How do you build that team? Because usually the, uh, how do you build that team if you're a giant company and how do you build that team if you're a, a small company where your marketing team is one, maybe two people? Yeah. Because the creative, the creative people don't want to talk or think that they're too cool for the data people and the data people think that they're too smart for the creative people. You know, it's really fun. I, I don't get the luxury of traveling with Claude Silver who's sitting back here who's our chief heart officer which sits on top of all of our HR. But if, when people ask me, like, you know, so I do this and we'll have a meeting and once in a while somebody will grab me or after dinner, after the meeting, they're like, okay, I understand, but like, how are you actually doing this? And the, there's really only two answers. One, through HR. To your point, it's taken us a good five years now of really pounding being the bigger person, being empathetic, being kind, because it is in the meetings of some, you know, listen, if you're a creative director who's worked at the fancy shops for 17 years and you're finally a GCD at Vayner and you have all the say and now all of a sudden you have a 23-year-old MIT math kid telling you you're wrong, that takes a level of empathy and buy-in to what we're trying to achieve that is very difficult. First of all, most shops in the world aren't 300 people deep in both media and creative under one roof in a non-holding company environment. So we're unique from day one. I didn't even realize it was unique. I was building it for myself if I buy Evian or Nike or what have you. And so that's one, the uniqueness of the DNA. But that is what everybody's gonna have to do. And the answer to your question is HR. You're gonna have to have human conversations. When you tell a math person that if math was the only way to do marketing, it would have been over a long time ago, or if you tell an art person that if you don't factor in the fact that we have so much more data than we did 20 years ago and you completely disregard it, you tell both of them they're vulnerable and then you actually act on it, our strength has come from actually firing some of our best people who haven't been able to buy into the humility and empathy needed to be successful. And then what happens is volume takes over. Let me tell you why volume will change your life. When you're making 6,000 pieces of content, and you actually think they're meaningful, an Instagram, a Facebook, a YouTube post, not just the TV, if you get everybody to believe they're valuable, well, as you can imagine, no longer does a strategist or a creative have to play political because she is not worried that it's the only thing that's coming out. When she's able to get all 800 of her ideas out into the world, she's not against an account person or my favorite or the client. The biggest breakthrough for us is our clients are more involved than ever because their idea in the shower that they send in on Slack or text is made within 72 hours, but it was about driving down the cost of that creative to make it feasible for the budgets that people have, but it's really, it's HR that makes it possible. Go ahead. But how about if you're a small company? If 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 you're starting off with one or two people? Talent. But it takes a lot of drive to keep on going through a lot of people in order to get there, no? Sure. 
but what's your alternative? <laughs> right. You know, and I, and I also would look at, I think you, you can look at comps. I think, silic, I think startups, direct to consumer startups, have the most natural DNA for art and math because that's all they know. When you look at Movement or Gymshark or, you know, or Fashion Nova or Purple Mattress, it's been math and art. And if you know, and I see you shaking your head. What's fascinating about Facebook and Instagram is they look at their data and they're like, "My God, who are these companies spending four million dollars a week in ads on Instagram?" You know, when you look at their data on the back end, it's a very fascinating thing that's going on. The biggest spenders are people you've never heard of, but you're about to hear of in 24 months. And then you've got the biggest companies. I mean, you literally have. I, I, I laugh with when some, like sometimes I'll get like a cryptic email from somebody from Facebook and Instagram. They're like, keep it up, you're right. You know, like, you know, it's like from a Gmail account. They're like, they don't even, it's not even from their work account. And they'll, and they'll, and they'll say things like, Gary, it's crazy, you're right. Like, like Mercedes has spent, we, we, have a, we have a Thai company spending more money this week than Mercedes will spend this year. This is these moments. Guys, Amazon was the biggest spender on Google AdWords in the first six years. If you look, Procter & Gamble was the biggest spender on television in the first decade. When there is underpriced attention, the biggest spenders become the leaders of the next generation. And then they become high on that supply so they can't see the next thing. Anyone else want to jump in? In terms of content for the Middle East, um, or your content concept, right? Mass content, it's always tailored towards you as a person as well. Mine? Yeah. For me, when I do it, of course, yes. How would you scale that in a region like the Middle East? You just mentioned that you translate content to separate people and you have the Arabic side. Um, how can you scale that faster with really authentic content if you don't speak Arabic yourself? Through translate, you know, some messages are fundamentally universal and the best you can do is subtitle it or you could voice over, but I think subtitles work. It works. It works. So you don't see a difference in, in, in basically user reactions. <laughs> It, it works even better here than in the U.S. because it's supply and demand. What would you recommend for this region? Because what I feel, as you said, consumption of Snap, Twitter, you forgot Twitter and all your listings. I yes, you only because the no- Twitter, I love Twitter, but I want to. I, I also think their ad product is not as underpriced in this market. You know, to me, I'm on a mo- Twitter is the platform that built me. I would come back here a year from now, have breakfast with you, and tell you not to spend a dollar on any of these things if at that moment it wasn't the right deal. I'm unemotional. In America, I throw a lot of people off because I tell everybody to spend all their money on Super Bowl, which is a television commercial, which 99% of the time I'm like, no, no, no. But the price is so underpriced for the mass reach. So Twitter's just not a good deal in comparison to how ridiculous the deal is do you know how underpriced Snapchat and Instagram ads are? You can get $2 CPMs to exactly who you're trying to get in front of. Then if you make content for them, like you have to understand, if you know you're getting in front of a 27 to 33 year old Middle Eastern woman that makes $100,000 a year, imagine what you would say. It's gonna be different than what you would do to a 55 to 80 year old Middle Eastern man who makes 40,000 a year. Yet we don't make content like that. Would you collaborate with local content production in, in native Arabic here? Sure, example? sure. You've got Muslim girl investment and stuff like that. Is that I an have. Area that you're looking at? Sure. I mean, you know, um, we've I've used fans in the past. Now Maha has set me up with a local team to do translation, which in the nuances has felt better. I, of course, but I think you know to bring value to this room. There's a lot of differences between a personal brand and businesses. I just, if I could just get everybody here to understand the sheer volume of content they need to be successful, everything would change. Because you don't understand why it's so powerful, your media costs will go down when you make content that people want. Unlike television and print and radio and outdoor, the internet gives you a lot of extra media if you produce content people like. There's your media cost and then there's your earned media cost that amortize down. I actually start in my family business, on my personal brand, or any of the hundred startups that I help do marketing for, or the five clients that wildly believe in me, I start with more expensive CPM costs because I want more narrow targets, which is inevitably gonna cost more than a broad 18 to 35, 
But then when I make content that those 87,000, 400,000, 2 million people love, the costs go down because the shareability goes through the roof and the amortized out impressions and media comes down. My friends, there are companies that have gone from zero to two to three to four to five, 600 million in revenue in the last three years in everybody's faces on the back of only Instagram and Facebook. You, you've said in the past that all companies should see themselves as a media company. The banks here today, you shouldn't see yourself as a bank, you should see yourself as a media company. I believe that. I think every company here looking at the list should have a daily podcast. Everyone. I don't, and, and I think what would you make as a podcast? You would have to go much higher. You would go into travel. You would go into finance advice. You would go into other things. But yes, I do believe that the white space and the next decade is going to be acting more like a media company than an advertiser because I do think the value that you have to bring the end consumer to penetrate their attention in a world of so much content is so much higher than it's ever been. And I think, I do think everybody here will have an editor-in-chief for their business before the next decade's done. Talk, talk us through the key insights as you'd see it from the, the Gary V content model. So what you're referring to is a, is a deck that I put out on LinkedIn and Medium and a lot of places which was kind of my gift to the, uh, the, the, the game where I tried to explain to people how remarkable it is. DRock is filming me right now. Basically this breakfast probably is gonna turn into 17 to 25 pieces of content. Six of them will be one minute, one will be the entire breakfast. That'll be a YouTube, Facebook thing. Then there's probably six or seven clips that I think are good enough for Facebook and Instagram. Six quotes that are put in an image that may not be of today. Uh, One LinkedIn article that's very business centric. A podcast for sure. So just imagine how I'm thinking. The reason I started filming myself, which was difficult when I started doing it three and a half years ago because it comes off unbelievably narcissistic It wasn't something I was looking forward to being judged on, but I couldn't give up the sheer amount of content that video in your whole day creates. And it is no question, if you look at what's happened to my profile, it is 100% on the back of film everything and then create 80 pieces of content a day from that day. How did you get over that obstacle of feeling, you know, narcissistic and and doing it all the time? Quickly. (laughs) <laughs> my, my whole, listen, my whole career, when I launched an e-commerce website for my dad's liquor store, you know, my little world of liquor store owners and my family, like, I was judged, everybody said the internet was a fad. It's 22 years ago. When I started doing a YouTube show about wine at the height of my retail power, I was judged because our numbers flatlined for the first time in eight years. When I, I'm please. I'm sorry to interrupt you. I read one of your books and you said that when you started the videos, you, you weren't really being yourself, right? Yeah, the first 80 episodes, I was so scared. You know, I, every day, my day consisted of eight hours on the phone or email selling $100,000 worth of wine to a high net worth individual. If you've seen any of my content, I run it pretty loose and I was very concerned that I would turn off our, our base and you can see the first 80 episodes, I'm holding it back. And then it was building so much popularity, I'm like, If they like this, imagine if I really was my full self. And at that point I was like, okay, there's more upside in this than the short term law. And that's basically my my barometer on everything is there's wins and losses, right? You know, and when the upside is far greater than the risk, I'm always willing to go all in. And and that's probably why I've gotten so loud about this volume thing and a lot of my other points of view. I think the the scale is tipped. Some of the biggest successes I've had with entrepreneurs or medium-sized businesses, especially in the car industry, was getting them to turn off all their marketing for a month to show them how ineffective their marketing was, which, which then made them feel comfortable to invest in my pattern. I, I do not think people, I, I know, let me rephrase, it's not that I think, I don't, I don't believe people realize, have any clue how much money they're actually wasting on traditional and traditional digital it's a lot. It's a, I do believe there are companies in the Fortune 1000 running around that are putting 90 cents of every dollar directly in the garbage. If you just imagine how much upside that makes me feel they have. Terry wants to jump in. Just, just to follow on that, Gary, um, 
having been in the, in the market here for 10 years now, I know that some of the biggest challenges, challenges exist within the organization to break through that barrier of, look, we know it's the right thing to do, but also what springs to mind is the phrase, you don't get fired for hiring IBM. So How, true. What, what, is, what are some of the tricks, tactics for, in, for internally to break through that barrier? It's, it's about courage. And there's no trick. The truth is a trick. The only thing that actually gets us at VaynerMedia hired is their business is on the brink of real trouble. People don't hire us when their business is healthy. And so there's no trick, brother. This is why I'm putting everything on film. This is about six years from now when the biggest companies, like companies are gonna feel this. You can't throw that much money in the garbage for a sustained period of time without eventually feeling the effects unless you have a monopoly, a disproportionately better, I'll give you one. I think Apple's a very bad advertiser. I just think they had a disproportionately better product for such a period of time that it disguises. And so, you know, I think, I think that um, everybody's, t- you know, fashion, I think is unbelievably vulnerable. The big fashion houses are completely naive to what's happening on Instagram as they continue to pour money into Vogue. You know, and so like, you'll have these moments. Then to to be very frank, I'm not unbelievably motivated of convincing anybody of anything. I speak from a selfish place. I wanna put on film what I know will be revered later on to leverage that. I'm not, I'm, I'm not in the business of convincing anybody. As a matter of fact, I apologize, it's in my best interest for people not to do this because when things co- collapse, their business will be less healthy which will allow me to buy businesses on one time EBITDA instead of three or nine the way they are now. So I'd actually prefer none of anybody would switch their behaviors. But why would you buy these businesses? Because I'm gonna remarket them. Because nostalgia is grossly underpriced. Brand is underpriced. I don't want to start new companies. I want to buy something that's marketed for 100 years for pennies on the dollar and then make them contemporary. No all, different all than, cool. yeah, if you look at Fila and Tommy Hilfiger and Marvel. Marvel was a bankrupt comic book company but the IP was so valuable you just had to repackage it. So I think that BMW and Mercedes should be competing with Alexa and Google for home devices. Why can't BMW be in the high-end razor business? I think people are very literal and not creative with how they use IP. Um, so that's why I want to buy brands because I think there's a lot of upside. Your, your content is always very authentic. Talk us through that journey of how it became more authentic and also <coughs> is it harder for a corporate to be authentic in its content because there is, and rightly so often, a corporate agenda that ever, it's very easy to, easy to identify as a consumer. Yeah, I think, I think authenticity is completely mapped to lack of fear. So then from a corporate perspective? It's driven by fear, right? It's all defense. I understand that. Like, I'm empathetic to that. I'll be honest with you, I'm not too overly passionate of the biggest executives and the biggest companies go out there and put out 80 pieces of content a day. I'm passionate for companies to realize they're spending tens if not hundreds of millions of dollars on a vanilla statement in vanilla output that's meaning nothing to nobody and that's a bad idea in 2019. You're better off not doing anything in that case. But you couldn't imagine how many clients I would, I would push to cut their marketing budget by 80% and do nothing differently. I, w- I think it would be remarkable for their PL. Mark, over to you. Yeah, cool, thank you. Uh, I mean, clearly you're, you're a media company and you produce content. If you were like the CEO of a big six creative agency, how would you change the business if you changed it? I mean, first of all, I have so much empathy for those big six because they're publicly held, right? I could never run a business that was reliant on every 90 days, I'd be fired. My poor CFO is barely holding on because I come up with six business ideas that lose money every minute and we, like, we like finally get our main machine awesome and I take all the profits away because I'm investing in everything. AI, machine learning, e-commerce, VR, AI, like, because I'm playing a marathon. So first of all, I don't, it's hard for me to give advice to a sprinter when I'm a purebred marathon runner, right? Um, the reason I think the big six are so vulnerable in a 25 year window is you can't be in the client service business and not have the client's interest in mind. 
Mine was, to your point, by accident. Because I want to become my clients, I'm trying to see the best behavior in the biggest companies in the world so I can see it, so I can figure out what to do next. I'm not Mother Teresa, I'm not a better human, I just have a different game that by accident, without even realizing when I started it, because I knew nothing about the industry, aligns more with clients. Uh, you know, I laugh when people are like, well what about now Deloitte? And I'd be like, oh, I'm just like, they're the same. They have to make numbers. There's a reason why the big six give the advice they give to their clients. It's because that's where the margin is. I don't believe the big six think TVC and programmatic digital are the best use of money. I think they think it's where they make the most margin. And guess what? I don't blame them. I blame the clients. I love when clients are like, yeah, the big six. I'm like, you're paying them. You're writing the check. You're the one at fault. You know, so it's, look, there's a reason companies go out of business. I know this is a lot of people giggling in the room. I think giggles tend by, it's people in agreement, right, and how silly things can be sometimes or how silly we actually act. I, to that point, I've actually never met anybody with a half a brain that disagrees in real life, right? Like I'll be on panels at CAN or A&A and there'll be four people disagreeing with me and drilling me, right? But then at three o'clock in the morning at the Carlton over Rosé, they're like, you're right. <laughs> you know, so, so I, you know, I, I always see giggling. I, 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 if you care about business, you're gonna agree because all the words out of my mouth are about business. If you're emotional about marketing data for the sake of marketing data, you're gonna disagree. I just haven't met the person that can pontificate properly why if Millard Brown and Nielsen's and Data Logics or anything else, if they were so good, why do so many of those reports come back with amazing ROAS yet the business is not healthy? I'm just getting polite signals for one more question. So what I will do is let's talk about the future. You mentioned about some of the companies you're investing in technologies. What are the future frontiers of digital? And what should we in the room know? I think one thing you'll appreciate is I don't like future questions. I don't know. I've had a great career because I act quickly once it happened, Mm -hmm. more so than guess. But I will tell you, and this I feel very comfortable with, you have to pay attention to voice. You have to because it's on my key principle of what I talked about in 2012. The reason Alexa and Google and Apple Pod or anything else that's invented, whatever China's up to or if somebody secretly is working on something meaningful, the reason it's gonna work is it's better for all of us. Voice is faster than texting. People don't call anymore because it's speed, not because of respect or tradition, it's time. We value time subconsciously in a way that you couldn't imagine. So voice to me, how your brand sounds is gonna be something not, I never thought of. How does Emirates sound? What's the sound, what's the voice of? So I think that's unbelievably fascinating. I think you'll be shocked a decade from today how many people are booking and making business decisions, buying strictly through themselves and a, and a voice device in business environments, in their car, at home, in every conference room. This, <laughs> this market will probably be first given its love for innovation and speed. It's going to be unbelievably powerful and very disruptive. The fact that I genuinely now see a path that eliminates Google search because of voice is fascinating to me. But if you look at your six year olds, they're gonna be 18 very quickly and they're being trained to search through voice, not through text. My six year old son knows everything about sports, he can't read because all he does is talk to Siri and Alexa all day and then I get home and have to answer questions about the 1984 NBA Finals and he's got it down. That's something he would have had to wait four or five years from. They're being trained in voice and you're gonna get sucked in. This isn't waiting 12 years for them to be just of age of doing something. We will all be sucked in and so as a professional and looking around the room knowing a lot of you are gonna be in the workforce for the next decade, two, three, I highly recommend starting to get comfortable with voice devices for yourself because that will just help you with, you know, just being native to these things really does matter at the end of the day. Gary, it was great to have you in Dubai. Thank you very much for sharing your insights with us. Thank you for Facebook for bringing us all together. And Thank I you. think a round of applause is necessary. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I was going to say, um, we have some time. Gary's going to stay here, maybe for another, you know, sort of five or ten minutes. Um, feel free to 
chat with Gary, but also grab some snaps, right? <laughs> awesome. By the way, thank you're you. You're fantastic. Thank, thank you. Such a pleasure. Um, I think we all agree it was great to have Gary with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Gary, I had to come say hello. Thank you. Shant from Facebook. How are you? We were listening to you on the radio earlier with my yes. wife. And she doesn't know who you are. Mm. She says, who is this guy? He's making a lot of sense. And she said something that really stuck with me. She's like, it's all common sense. But common sense ain't that common, right? She's right. And I'm like, you know what? Everything you're saying, everyone's nodding to. No one's doing anything about it. They're playing within frameworks that don't allow them to. How do we expand those frameworks? I, you know, it usually happens through carnage. It really does. Right, Unfortunately, right. this everything I just talked about, when the world economy collapses, which it should have a long time ago, but when it does, people will have to reassess what they're gonna do. When Coca-Cola has a dollar for every five dollars, they're gonna care to spend it smarter. Right. And that will change everything. We're already seeing that on the retail side. So I it cover retail as part it of the It makes Facebook. sense. They're dying, right? From the West Hamilton's coming in, East Alibaba's coming in. That's right. Like, Where, do do we go? Neck? Where do we go? Mm -hmm. Those are the guys who are actually doing best with Makes us. sense. But uh, look, thank, thank you so much for your time. Thank I you. gotta take a picture so sure. I can show that I actually spent time with you today. Thanks Fantastic. so much, yeah? Take Good care. Good meeting you. Thank take you. Care. Hi. How are you? I'm Christine. Christine. I'm head of marketing at Facebook. I just nice wanted to, to see thank you. Thank you. Uh, I've attended God knows how many talks and uh, you're really inspiring. So I just thank wanted you. to thank you thank because you. you're very spot on. Many people think of marketing as a medium just to promote a business. Uh, or, or just to promote a brand, uh, the hook that's missing is the business side. Uh, and I, I just agree. wanted to thank you for that because I always believed that marketing is an enabler to business. 100%. Nobody thinks about it. I agree. So, so thank you for so saying that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Nice thank to you. meet you. Thank you. I know I already asked the question, no worries. but I, I got to ask a question not on the marketing side. I'm not a marketer, I'm an entrepreneur. Uh, and I love watching your videos because you know whenever I wake up and I'm like, oh, this is hard. Like running a business is difficult. I watch your video. I'm like, nah, I can do more. Mm -hmm. uh, but you had a question once and you posted it uh, where someone was asking you, do I spend money on marketing? Yes. Or do I spend money on growing my team? Yes. And you said, given the option, always grow the team. Mm -hmm. How does that work in like on the flip side? That when the market's down, how do you then? Uh, grow and invest while at the same time understanding that the you know the economy might, might not be doing so well uh, or there's a recession like how do you position I'm, an SME business to me uh, to in, me a, in a recession to me during a recession that's your biggest opportunity okay. so it's about it's about holding down your costs okay. and and bringing the most value to the small group that's still spending to me those are accelerating times okay so to me it's just about running a P&L no different than your home. Right. Like, you know, you just gotta keep your costs down and you as the founder need to like work your brains out because you yeah. have to realize that's a great opportunity to grow. So like find that one niche and like really own it and, and try and push it out. A hundred percent. Okay. A hundred percent. All right, cool. That Thank makes you. sense. Thank you so much. You mind if I grab, grab a song? Yeah, for sure. Okay, we can wait. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Gary. Keep nice to meet yeah. you. Thank you, good luck. Hey, how are you? So happy to see you. Thank How's you. Going? I'm very Eugene. good, Eugene. Uh, Dubai Airport. Very nice. Um, I've always wondered, because it's such a mass market, and it's so impersonal, being in an airport traditionally, how do you make that a personal experience for people? Uh, you know, I, go ahead. It's because the, the, the issue we have now, which is a great opportunity, it's the disruption you spoke about. Suddenly, we, the airport, have got a relationship with travelers through digital and social and all of that. Um, it's a captive, it's almost a captive it's, audience. It's about, it's about scaling the unscalable. It's about you hiring 30 people who have the data that I'm in the airport and send me a message that the best groupier, because you have the data, or you could. Yeah, you could. It's a, most people don't want to hire 35 people right. to engage. Yeah, they want exactly. everything. So to me, it's one-on-one -on -one comes at the expense of scaling humans. Most people don't want to make that commitment. I think that's where the opportunity is. But how would, how would you feel, for example, that I'm speaking to you as Gary going to the airport, and it's not just so generic. As long as you made, as long as you made the promise up front, I'd feel remarkable. Sure. I just launched right. a direct-to-consumer wine business. Yes. That's built on. Wine. That's right. Yes. Which is yeah. built on one-on-one -on -one engagement, yeah. personal, yeah. you know, engagement on Club Empathy, That's and and people are freaking out. They love it. Yeah.
Uh, you want me to sign this? Would you mind? Yeah, you have so a pen? Old school, yeah. I appreciate it. I'm very flattered. <laughs> Thank you. Who do I make it out it's to? It's Eugene. Eugene. Yeah. Thanks. You got it. I read it and I reread it. <laughs> it means a lot to me. Thank you very Thank much. You. Photo? Do you mind if I just get it? Of course. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gary. You're welcome. Good luck. Have a great trip. All the best. How are you? So nice to meet you. Good for you. Upside? Yeah, upside. And then um, two questions. One thing is, what do you think of Instagram TV versus YouTube? No. YouTube. Sorry, Mel works at me. Yeah, she was telling me. Entrepreneur We're well. talking about it both. And she works at my wife, and the two of them have yeah. this great side hustle. I'm so proud of this. Yeah, the lifestyle uh, yeah. clothing brand. They're working their asses off. IGTV has not popped yet. It wouldn't be. I've got to head off. You're such meeting, a pleasure. You're beating my boss today. Okay. He's a real character. Hope okay. Us, okay? Uh, Thank you for your time and your attention. If you can convince him. Then we've got then, something. Then, yeah. Understood. Okay. I wish you well. And then what do you think is the best? Because we, of course, we have our full-time jobs so nice. What about influencers? We are working with influencers. We work with a company. We want to work with smaller influencers. Yes. More and smaller. More and smaller. But we haven't seen, and this might be the pop. Me. Yeah, we haven't seen sales. No. You, what you may want to ask them to do is to do one lifestyle post, and then in stories, do a swipe up for sales. You need to set them up to give you that. Yeah, and what do you think the best way to spend our time? Obviously, this is something that we're Time. Like, how do we make the most of our time? I, you know, there's so many variables that come to that question. I would focus your time as much as possible on things that you're good at, not things that you're not as good at. That's a very funny thing that I talk a lot about with entrepreneurs. If you have limited time, squeeze more at what comes natural to you. Most people try to fix things that aren't there. A lot of times the narrow deep will set you up to go wider. Hi, how are you? Thank you so much, by the way, really inspiring. So I'm on Facebook, I look after travel in the region. Uh, but that's not why I, why I want to. My family business is in retail. And yes. I sort of grew up folding t-shirts. And yes. Things. How do you think intermediaries, you mentioned sort of this intermediation, can continue to add value? So it's like we do global brands like the North Face and uh, Vans and, you know, Skate and Surf and Outdoor. And we, were, we have an ex- so geographic distribution. But that's going away, right? Because it's going to get e-commerce. They're going direct to market. Correct. Our suppliers are like... It's just a matter of time. It is. And I see you have to build. You, you have to build your own brand. There's, no, there's nothing else. Yeah. <laughs> it's a race to that. Okay. Like I said, and I saw you nod because you yeah. got it. Yeah. If you're in the middle, you're in trouble. Yeah. My dad's liquor store's in the middle. Yeah. Wineries are going to go direct. Like, you've got to find ways to build your own brands. Okay. There's nothing else. Yeah. It's your only weapon 15 years from now. And it's that, not going to happen tomorrow, which is why people don't do it. Yeah. They still see their numbers are okay. Yeah. But then one morning you wake up and the van's contract is up yeah. and they don't renew it. They did, and, and one of them went away that way. Yeah, so. They're all going to go that way that way. Yeah. All of them. Yeah. That's not... Otherwise, you're in this business. Yeah. If you're in the middle, you're in trouble. Yeah. So while you've got the leverage of those contracts, yeah. develop a label. Use the Name profit, it after you. That's right. Yeah, yeah, to there is no yeah. other move. Yeah. And actually, it's interesting to say that the contracts run up. They don't renew. They go regionalized. So they go that's here. Right. And, they cover, and you can see that the regional ones will eventually go to the global. A hundred percent. The local intermediary or the regional intermediaries will go away. A hundred percent. That's a hundred percent. Really good. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Do you mind if we take Yeah, let's do it. Sorry. Yeah, go for it. Go for it. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Love your t-shirt. Thank you, brother. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Likewise. Very nice to meet you. All right, buddy. By the way, that was a super, super, super job. Yeah, it went well. Yeah, thank you. People enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah, totally. All right, my friend. Jump in. No, no, no. You do one, and then I'll do one. Oh, he's there you go. Oh, good stuff, man. Oh, no, thank you. Thank, thank you very, very much. Thank it's you. Great morning, and you got shitloads of content there, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. I mean, that's the best. Like such everything's idea. so meta. Yeah. My life is meta. Yeah. Yeah, it's like I'm doing things for the content. Yeah. The like was, you're gonna get you're gonna get pinged by like friends you knew from a long time ago and be like, hey, yeah. was that like that's the best part of people that I do talks with. They always hit me up. And they're always like, you know, hey, hey, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we, 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 we need to go. Yeah.
けて。